This is lesson four in an invitation to programming. In the last lesson, you learned about variables, boxes in memory that hold numbers. In this lesson, you will learn about variables that hold words. The variables that hold numbers are called numeric variables. We identify each one with a label. The variables that hold words instead of numbers are called string variables. Think of a string as a string of letters. String variables get a label, too, but a string variable label ends in a dollar sign. The dollar sign looks like an S for string. Question one. Which of these is a variable that can hold words? Remember, we stored numbers in variables using the word let. Here's how a word is stored in a string variable called animal. We type let animal dollar sign equal dog. Notice the quote marks around the word restore. Question two. Now type in a statement that stores the word cat in a string variable called animal. There is one other difference between numeric and string variables. You have to tell the computer at the beginning of the program how many letters each string variable will have to store. You tell the computer how many letters to store with a dimension statement. A dimension statement uses the word dim. So dim a dollar sign four makes a box in memory called a that can store up to four letters. Question three, how many letters can be stored in a string variable book? Of course, when you use the string variable later, you can put in fewer letters than your dim statement specified but there won't be room for more letters than you called for. Question four, which line of this program tells the computer how many letters are stored in name? Question five, which line stores the letters in name? Question six, Type an input statement at line 10 using a string variable called choice. Question seven. Type a dimension statement at five making six spaces in choice. Now, if you like, try writing some programs using string variables. You might ask for a name and print it back.
This is lesson five of An Invitation to Programming. One of the most important things about computers is that they can evaluate information and make decisions, if they get the right instructions from you. In this lesson, you will learn the instructions to use. We can have the computer look at the contents of a variable. We can tell it that if it finds a certain thing there, it should take a certain action. If it doesn't find what we're looking for, then it won't take that action. We do this with an if-then statement. Here's how an if-then works. This program asks for the answer to 2 plus 2. Line 20 asks for the input. In line 30, the words, if answer equals 4, tell the computer to look at the input stored in the variable called answer and see if it's 4. If the input is 4, the computer goes on to the rest of the line. There, the words then print correct. Tell the computer it should print the word correct on the screen. Question 1. In this program, the computer will print sorry, no credit, if you input what number? This line reads, if A does not equal 4, then print. The symbol in the middle means is not equal to. You type two keys in the upper right-hand section to make this symbol. Maybe you want the computer to make a response when the input is not a certain number. You might want to say wrong when the answer is not 14, for example. Line 40 in this program reads, if x is not equal to 14, then print wrong. When the user types in any number except 14, the computer will print the word wrong. Notice that in this program, we also have a line to print right, only when the input is 14. Suppose the input you get isn't anything you have specified in any if-then statement. In this program, for example, suppose someone types in 13 as the answer to 5 times 8. Well, the computer will not finish the if-then line. It will go right on to the next line of the program as soon as it finds the wrong number in the variable. Watch now as this program is run and someone types in an input. The user didn't get the message good because the input was not 40. Question 2. Which instruction will handle mistakes in this program? String variables can be used in if-then statements. Remember to use quotation marks in let and if-then statements when using string variables. Question 3. What input makes the computer print hi? Question 4. What does the computer print if you type in Alice? Now we'll learn a basic word that causes the computer to skip to another part of the program. The word is go to. Look at this program. When this program is run, the computer will do line 10. Then it will come to line 20, which says go to line 10. So the computer will do just that. It will skip directly back to line 10 in the beginning of the program. Watch what happens when the program runs. The computer goes back to line 10 over and over. We stopped the run for you. Otherwise, it would never end. To stop such a program that you've written, press the break key. 
but don't press it while this teaching program is on. Question 5. Look at this program. What will it print? After this lesson, try writing a program to send messages to your own family. Ask for a name, and then use if-then statements to look at the string variable that's input and print an appropriate message for that person. Use your imagination, but be sure to use a dimension statement, a string input, and if-then statements. This is the end of Lesson 5 and of the teaching lessons on this demo tape. The next and last program on this tape is a demonstration which shows you some more complex programs and explains how they work. Program 6, Demonstration. This is a demonstration program for an invitation to programming. The program is not going to be like the others. We are going to show you two actual programs written for the Atari computer and how these programs work. The purpose is not to teach so much as to show you what can be done with your computer. The actual programming techniques can be learned from your Atari basic manual. The first program is the game of number guess. Here is a listing of the program. The second program is called the Atari Symphony. It plays music and draws a picture. Here is its listing. Before we go through the programs, let's run them to see what they do. The first program, Number Guess, asks you to guess a number picked by the computer between 1 and 100. You get seven chances to guess it. You can play it as many times as you wish. Push Return to start.
Okay, now let's look at the Atari Symphony program. Push return to start. <laughs> Now let's look at the two programs to see how they work. Let's start with number guess. Notice that most of the lines are spaced 10 units apart. This allows the programmer plenty of room to add lines to the program that may fall between two lines. The first line of the program contains a graphics mode instruction. It tells the computer to go into graphics mode zero there are several different graphics modes on the Atari computer. This one clears the computers and allows type to appear on the screen. You can learn more about these graphics commands in Chapter 10 of the Atari Basic Manual. The next line sets the background color. Again, you can learn more about this in Chapter 10 of the manual. This program is going to give the player seven chances to guess the number. Line 50 starts counting the tries at zero. Line 60 picks a random number from one to 100. Chapter four, page 91, explains how this random number formula works. The computer now has picked a random number between one and 100. Let's say that the number the computer picked was 74. The user does not know this number. In line 80, the player types in his or her guess. Let's say that the player guesses 50. The computer now goes to line 90, which counts the try by adding one to the number stored in tries. Tries now equals one. The computer then goes to line 100, which reads, if guess is greater than number, then print too high, guess lower. Since guess is not larger than the number, the computer skips this line. Line 110 reads, if guess is smaller than number, then print too low, guess higher. This condition is true, so this line is activated. The player gets this message. Line 120 is not true, so the computer goes on. Line 130 is also not true, since tries equals 1 and not 7. Line 140 sends the computer back to line 70 for another go-around. The user now tries another guess. This time, the guess equals 75. Tries equals tries plus 1 or 2. Line 100 is now activated, and the player gets the message too high, guess lower. The program falls through to 140, which sends the computer back to line 70. Now the user makes one more try and gets a little lucky. He or she guesses 74. The computer now goes to line 90 and makes tries equal to 3. It goes to 100, then 110, and finally to line 120. Line 120 is the true condition, so it is activated and the computer gets sent to line 300. At line 300, the player is told that his or her guess was correct and the game is over. Now let's look at the Atari Symphony program. This program makes use of sound as well as graphics and color. The first thing to note is that most of the variables that determine the sound and color are picked at random in lines 530 to 560. This makes the patterns that you see and hear strictly random. Lines 590 to 607 turn on the sound registers. The Atari computer has four sound registers labeled 0, 1, 2, and 3. This number is the first one in the sound instruction. The second number in the instruction determines what note the register will play. 
You can learn more about this in Chapter 10 of your Atari Basic Manual. When the sounds are made, the computer draws a line on the TV screen. Line 570 tells the computer what color to make the line. Line 580 tells the computer where to draw the line. When you ran this program, you may have noticed how many lines the computer drew on the screen and how many times the musical notes were changed. This is due to one line, line 520. Line 520 tells the computer to repeat the sequence of instructions, following it 50 times. Line 630 shows where the sequence is to end and calls for the next count of the cycle. This kind of repeating loop is called a for next loop. You can learn about it in chapter six of Atari Basic. The cycle stop when cycle equals 50 and lines 640 to 670 turn off the sound registers. And there you have it, two sample programs out of the infinite number that could be created on the Atari computer. And now, congratulations. You have completed an invitation to programming. You now have some knowledge of how to program the computer. Try writing some programs now using what you've learned. Of course, you won't remember everything perfectly and will make a lot of mistakes as you program. Well, here's one more thing you should learn. All programmers, no matter what level they're at, make mistakes as they program and have to try out the programs, find and correct their mistakes. To learn more basic and more about the exciting things the Atari computer can do, study the Atari basic book. You'll find it easy to understand since much of the material will be familiar to you because you learned it in an invitation to programming.